uh, talk and teasers for your for graduate students. I also want to welcome, I think it's the environmental journalism class yes. here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, and um, I am very pleased that our speaker this month, often we have somebody from outside the school, but now we have a very own Professor Kim Newman, whom I know all of you know as our photography uh, photojournalist uh, professor, also a very small media. If you've been really lucky or will be lucky to go to Orbe in Italy with him for five weeks and take wonderful images. Um, you might not know, but he has a, decades of professional experience around the world. He was a photo editor for Knight Ritter in Washington, D.C. He was a photo editor for uh, Reuters in London, also in Seoul and in Japan. Uh, he's been a freelancer everywhere from Spain to Japan, across the United States, for places like the New York Times, Time Magazine, Forbes Magazine, you name it. So he has a storied uh, career. And um, also, too, you'll have an opportunity to learn more about his photojournalism. He's pretty famous in Seoul, Korea, for his role in taking the iconic picture of the um, South Korean freedom movement and protests in 1987. What he's going to talk about today is more personal, his uh, research project, and also perhaps a bit more artistic than photojournalism. So thank you all for coming, and Kim, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, my, bi my biography title is uh, going to be Famous in Korea. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> It's not a bad place to be thinking. Okay, so um, for the past two, year, two years, uh, I've been working on this other project. It, it started uh, during my sabbatical uh, in the fall of 2017, but it started long before that. Um, Algernon Newton is um, my grandfather. And I'll get into a little bit of that. But I'm going to talk about uh, who he was and how this project came about. Uh, the research that went into getting this project off the ground. Um, the discovery of the images. And uh, the photographic process, uh, a little bit that's gone in, into producing them. Uh, show you some of the current results uh, of this project so far. Uh, and then talk a little bit about where this project is headed and where I hope it will, it will end up. Um, so, the Newton family, um, I grew up in Southern California. My father, who was a British actor, uh, died when I was about two and a half. My mother was his fourth wife. And after he died, I really didn't know a great deal about that side of the family. And I grew up hearing stories and so on. And, and at some point, um, I realized that my grandfather was a landscape painter. I, I knew that as a child. I never saw any of the work. I never knew anything about it. Um, but as I got older and I got more interested in uh, the family, uh, much older, because I really didn't I uh, cared that much about it for a long time. Um, I discovered and realized that my great grandfather was Henry Newton, and he and Windsor got together and they created the Windsor and Newton Paint Company. And if you're an artist at all and have ever painted with artist paints, and you go into any art store today, you'll see that Windsor and Newton paints are are uh, a mainstay of the of the art of the art world and uh, and he what what Henry Newton did was to invent the little tubes that paints went into and from that um, he got together uh, with Windsor and they created this this company uh, which stayed in the family until about the early 70s and then it was it was sold off but my writings he's talking about the composition, the light, um, and how he kind of constructed uh, these paintings. So he was very detailed, and there's hundreds and hundreds of pages. And so my wife and I made an appointment with the Tate uh, Britain, um, and they had 
they had just been reaching out to the family to invite them to come and, and see the archives. And so we spent uh, a week going in and out of there, and I was able to photograph everything just with my phone, um, uh, everything that was in those archives. In 1938, he showed up in Tucson, Arizona, <laughs> which was pretty weird. Um, but he. What does that headline say? It says, English painter of houses, portraits, amazed by desert. <laughs> so in, in 19, we discovered this. Uh, my wife, who looks up our, our family heritage, uh, she's much more interested in my family's heritage than I am. But um, um, we, I, I knew he had done this American trip, but we didn't know he came to to Tucson until we discovered on Ancestry.com that he arrived by boat in LA in like 1937, 38, and then he disappears. We don't see any trace of him until he comes across the border at Nogales, and there's a record of him crossing the border at Nogales in 1938. And he, in England, he was well known for painting estate homes. He would be commissioned by very wealthy people to, to paint their homes. And one of, the pe one of the people that he painted their home in England uh, had a house here in Tucson, and she invited him uh, here, and we found this story in the Arizona Daily Star. Is that the house he stayed in? No, that's it, actually, uh, I, that's in my series that I'll show at the end, but that's, uh, that's actually in, um, in Cambridge. But while he was here, he painted the San Javier Mission. And one of the things that I started to really realize once I started to understand my grandfather more was that he painted in a photorealistic style. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes this project work, is that his paintings are not, although he took a lot of um, artistic license in his paintings, his style was very much uh, in a form that could match up with my photographs. And so as I went through the archive, he had photographed all of his paintings in black and white. And on th these are all in the Tate archive. So as we read through and look at all the paintings that he photographed, it also gives us descriptions of where they are. So it's, it hasn't been totally easy to find all, all the locations, but because of his uh, prolific um, keeping track of everything uh, we have. The other area that he uh, was influenced by was Canaletto. So in the early, in the early part of his career, um, he was part of a he was part of a few groups of painters, the Lamorna Group in, in Cornwall, and he would often go out and paint with them. And those painters were on the spot painters. They would go to a scene. They would paint the whole scene while they were there, uh, and he didn't like that. He really hated doing that. He was much better at going out and sketching and coming back to his studio uh, and then painting. But he, he wasn't getting as far as he thought he could in the early 1920s, so he went to the British Museums, the National Gallery, and he started studying photographers, and he really got in, or painters, and he really got into Canaletto. Uh, who was an Italian painter, and he <laughs> painted in this realistic style. And one of the things that he's really picked up from Cavaletto are the skies and the clouds. And you can see that uh, in his paintings. Who is as someone Piccolo? That is the, the plaza on this side. Oh, with That's a place. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Grand Canal. Um, but that's how they title it. So someone Piccolo is the name of the building? Yeah, it's a... Yeah, it's Somione. It's Somione. I think it's the same building here. <laughs> so, after he, he developed this, he didn't really copy Canaletto, but what he did was he really studied, he spent years and years studying Canaletto's style, he went to Italy, he, he just started to research Canaletto in many ways, 
And over, the, over time, he started to develop his own style of, um, of painting and developing techniques that, be, that really became um, his signature. So the process, once, once I realized we could sort of go out and, and, and find some of these places, the first place we went to, because Algernon photographed, in, he painted a lot of the canals in, Lon in London. Um, he did buildings, he did estates, but one of his real passions were, were the London canals. And this is a place called Little Venice uh, on the Regent's Canal in London. And when my wife and I first went here, um, we knew that we knew that this painting was was in Little Venice. We we knew that, but we didn't know where. And we got off the train and we walked over to Little Venice and we're just kind of walking around on the path. And I turn around oh and I go, wow. "There's the building. Wow. <laughs> That's the building in the painting." So the process of doing this was, okay, now we find a location. But a lot of what, what Algernon did in his paintings had to do with light, time of year, time of day, the clouds. And a lot of what I do in photography, um, when it's not photojournalism, is, li is light. And trying to be able to match that light. So to, to photograph this, you just can't show up. You have to go back, you have to observe where the light's coming from, what time of day is best. And if you look at the painting, you can see that the light fills this side of the building, and this side is in shadow. So to me, that told me that it was a sunset picture, because west is over here, and the sunset's over here. And you start to you start to see where the light is and what he was seeing uh, when he was there. So I went back many times, and the clouds just weren't right. The light, the, the first time I went, the light was on the building, so I knew I had to come back later in the day. Thankfully, there's a really great pub right here. <laughs> we watch. So, when you photograph in Britain, pubs are really important. And so I kept going back, and then I would do tighter pictures, and, and, uh, and then there were obstacles, there were canal boats in the way, there were ducks in the way, there were people in boats. There was, there's all kinds of obstacles that happen. But then you get the picture wow. with the sky and, and all the, the light uh, that hits it. And if you notice in the painting, is this, building? this building is no longer there. Mm -hmm. These buildings have been changed, and I think they're council flats now. If you look um, back at this picture, the trees block it, but there's a white mm -hmm. set of white buildings back here. Mm -hmm. But this tree and the island are the same, mm -hmm. they're just bigger. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of the obstacles. Mm -hmm. But here's the little island. Mm -hmm. Is right here in the painting. What time of year do you think this is? Um, well, because of the trees, it's summer, and that's been a lot of the um, obstacle with this project. That's why I went this winter was to get winter scenes because he, if you, this was painted in 1925, and if you think about um, a lot of the painting scenes he did. The trees were either very small, here there's no trees, right? And then if you look today, whoops, you know, it's all these trees have grown, grown up. Um, the English often say, uh, Londoners often say there aren't enough trees in London. I personally disagree. <laughs> now, that I've, now that I've done this project and I can see that they're everywhere. It also looks like the air is a lot cleaner now. In his picture, it looks like there's a lot more smoke and soot in well, the sky. And, and that's really interesting because what he also put in a lot of his uh, paintings, which we'll see in a, in a second, he, he also put 
uh, a lot of the smokestacks that were in London during that time, and in this time it was all coal burning, right? right? And the air was horrible. Yeah, you can see it in the really report. Good. You can see it in that picture, in the next picture, in his in his painting. Is there like a little port or like a mooring there in the boat now? Yeah, here. Yeah. yeah, this is where today they, they put the part canal boats. Um, uh, in, in his day there were canal boats, but they were all working. Today they're all pleasure. So then, uh, behind this building, if you walk along here, there's a bridge. And you go behind, you get to uh, another part of the canal called Paddington Basin. And uh, this painting was also done in like 1923 or 1925. Um, and when we went back to look at this, it was really difficult to figure out where this painting was taken from. So this is Paddington Basin today. And I think. I must have spent weeks going back. I think Sherry and I went there a couple of times. Uh, and then when she flew home, I was still in London for another month or so. And I kept going back. And I kept waiting for the light. I kept waiting for things to change. And I kept looking for where this place was. And then I finally realized, even with all the construction, that it was at this end of the canal. It was at the very end of the canal. And then it determined, well, OK, do I photograph it? I tried it in the day. I tried it. I waited for good light. Then I thought, I started to see when the lights came on that it made for a really interesting picture. It wasn't the same time of day as his, but I thought, OK, well, this is really going to show the change. So I kept going. I kept trying different things. I, I, was, I liked the pictures I was getting. But it wasn't until that picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And this. Yeah. Which told me I found the spot uh -huh. where he took his original painting. And oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Okay. I kept looking for that steeple in the background. <laughs> yeah, the and the steeple, the steeple oh, is over here. It's still there. But and it's behind it, all the buildings. Yeah. Wow. Huh. So that's the process that I've gone through with all of the paintings. And the ones that I'm going to show you now are the ones that are finished. So there's, there's 11 that are finished. And I've just picked up three more on this last trip. Um, but there's a lot more to do. And yes, it's not photojournalism. <laughs> I am changing things. Um, um, to kind of match what, what I'm looking at here. So here, with, with St. Paul's Cathedral, it's, it's against the law to block the view of this cathedral. So you can't build buildings to block the, the view from the tents. And so it's pretty much the same. And what I really discovered was that even in the new buildings, the same colors were showing up uh, in, in, from his paintings. Professor Newton. Um, for the benefit of my students who are science students and not journalists, do you mind explaining just briefly when you say it's not photojournalism what you mean? Well, ethically, we don't change the content of an image in photojournalism. And here, I'm, I'm using uh, uh, tools in Photoshop to block out the color and add black and white. Mm -hmm. And I'm changing the content of the image. Thank you. Which you wouldn't do if you were working as a photo journalist. That's, that's right. Wow, those clouds. Oh. So these clouds wow. are just <laughs> amazing. Mm -hmm. But it took, I think, three weeks and 10 or 15 times going back here until I saw the clouds. Wow. And actually, while I was out there, I thought, OK, Algernon has hooked into my project, and he's helping me out. <laughs> because, because these clouds really did just start to appear. And it was really quite amazing. This is, this is, a, um, uh, this is what he calls the Dutch garden, 
but it's, it's actually the serpentine uh, in Kensington Gardens. And everything, if you look very closely, that steeple is right here. And the trees have all covered that steeple. And then this ugly um, uh, building uh, has been put in its place. But the Italian, this is the Italian garden. He calls it the Dutch garden. But in fact, the real Dutch garden, he would change names of things. The real Dutch garden is in front of Kensington Palace to the left. Uh, but for some reason, he named this painting the Dutch garden. Yeah. Uh, um, when I was like uh, presenting in the class about uh, Pakutin Gorski, who photographed mm -hmm. Russia at begin in color in the beginning of the 20th century, and uh, there was also like this poor thing that uh, trees were smaller, and people who travel now don't even see these scenes because of trees. That's like, right. Why? Yeah. why? I mean, that's right. Uh, Doesn't people stop cutting them, or I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Right, weren't they full-grown trees? When yeah, they well, they were, yeah, they, they, just were grew, they just grew. And you know. before that, like... Uh, they were planted. So, you have to remember, this painting was done uh, in what year? 1922. So, they've had a lot of time uh, to grow. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that, that uh, people like before in the 18th, 17th century just cut down the trees and planted new or what? <laughs> in some cases in these parks they planted new trees, out in the war there was a lot of change. So, um, so this painting uh, is of Lambeth Bridge in 1923 and this is um, the same bridge which has changed in 2017. And the interesting story about this is that um, uh, these buildings were replaced because this was destroyed in the war. This was destroyed by a flood. And after the war, they built these buildings. And while I was photographing um, these buildings, I was standing over here. And I spent about an hour waiting for the clouds to change and the light and the boats. And you know, here's this old sailboat. and here's the new boats of the day. Uh, and as I'm, as I'm finishing to leave, I was there about an hour, hour and a half, I'm surrounded by two motorcycle police. And they said, what are you doing? And do you know what this building is? <laughs> and, I, and I did know what this building is. Just over here is Parliament Square, in Big Ben, Houses of Parliament. And I did know what that building was. And, uh, and I said, um, yeah, it's the MI5 building, <laughs> which is the equivalent of the FBI building, the Homeland Security building. And, uh, and they said, well, the people in that building have been watching you on CCTV, <laughs> and they want to know what you're doing. And I would carry on my phone the paintings that I was, nice. that I was recreating, and then I had a discussion with them. They took my driver's license. And they spent about 15 or 20 minutes, and they called him, and they came back, and they said, OK. Well, That's a great cover story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this also goes, uh, this is Cumberland Terrace, and it was destroyed in the war. And then it was rebuilt. And um, we, thought, we thought initially that they just didn't add the third floor to the building. Um, but in fact, they didn't add the third. Um, they didn't add the third floor. It was never intended to create uh, a third floor of the building. This was just destroyed and they built it back this way. But this also goes to persistence. We came back a bunch of times uh, when it was stormy. And then one day I was just wandering around London somewhere. I think I had been to lunch, and I noticed the sky changing. And I, and I uh, got on a subway, and I got over here really quick. And it was pouring rain while I was there. And I needed to get in this garden. And I had been here before, and, they, and it had a lock in it. And, and the, the cars that are parked in this parking lot are all Rolls Royces and Lamborghinis. So the people who live here. Uh, I thought if I stood out here in the rain, 
long enough, somebody would get nervous and come out and wonder why I was there. <laughs> and then I would ask them how I could get in the garden. And sh sure enough, the guy comes out and says, can I help you? And I and say, you said, yes, I'm an MI5. Yes, I'm. <laughs> and I showed him the picture of what I wanted to do, and he sent me over to the porter, who was this 90-year-old man, uh, who opened the door. Aww. I explained what I was doing. He got a key ring that was like this big, with a thousand keys on it, and he's going through it, and I'm watching the light, and I'm going, oh God, it's going to be over in a minute. And he hands me the key, and he says, bring it back when you're done. So where do you think your uncle, the perspective is a little different, where do you think your uncle was standing? My grandfather. I mean your grandfather, sorry. Well, he was in this garden. This is the, this is the garden, uh -huh. and that was always there. Um, it may be lower now, it may be, I, I don't know, but he's, he's pretty close. This is, there's three of these buildings, and this is definitely the one uh, that, he, that he painted. But he um, may have changed the perspective a little bit himself. Yes, and, right? he, does, and okay. he does that a lot. Because you look at that center, the center um, yeah. one is a little bit, Co yeah. Coming even rotated a little block. more than the building. That's yeah. right. It doesn't block yeah. that. And, and this is impossible to get, so it is probably his artistic his license. His artistic license, yeah. yeah. And also, we don't know in 19, um, what year was this, 1931, what the relationship was. This is a yeah. totally different wall, and I oh, uh -huh. just have no idea what uh -huh. it would have changed. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you know that maybe before it was like more public and now it's private owned? Or like, did you it, it had always been, uh, Cumberland Terrace had always been private residence. Oh, okay. um, maybe not to the upper classes as it was once was, but it, but it's, um, it, it had always been residence. Uh, but here's a good example of his artistic license. This is Anglesey Abbey, which is the painting that was in the newspaper mm -hmm. from the star. And it's the same today. The painting actually, uh, what happens to a lot of um, estate homes in Britain is the families can't afford to maintain them, so they give them to the National Trust, and they maintain them and then open them to the public as museums. And this painting hangs in the bedroom of the former um, owner of the estate, uh, just in front of his bed, so he must have really loved this painting because he has thousands of paintings, and this one was hanging in his bedroom. Which is pretty amazing. But the house is the same, but you'll notice that there's this little building here and these Italian trees here. Well, that exists on this property, but it's over here. And he moved it and filled his composition to create depth in the picture. Mm -hmm. And did, is that, and he maybe put even a tree in the front? Well, there, yeah, or this tree was, yeah. Yeah. There are these trees, and that's another thing he painted. He, he made these elongated trees, and if you look around at the places he painted with these trees, you actually see them. You can start really? to see them. But whether that just grew out, if you move back further, there's more trees, but I couldn't get the same perspective. Um, this is Mulgrave Castle, which is up in Yorkshire near uh, Whitby, and this has a really interesting story. My half brother, who is uh, heavily involved in in putting together a catalog resume of my grandfather's work, um, knew the the Mark. I always get the Marquis, Mark, Mark, the Marquis, Marquis, the Marquis of Normandy, who lives in this castle. His wife. Uh, is a friend of my brother's, and they invited us up um, to stay here for the weekend so I could get this picture. And um, this, is a, this is one of these estates that the family actually still lives in it, and owns it, and runs it. They mainly live in London. They, they only come up here on holidays and weekends and so forth. So they invited me up, and, and I was able to take that picture. The mother of the current Marquis just died. She was 97, but she had this painting in her uh, in in her cottage, 
And we went and saw her, and at the time she was as, as sharp as day. Uh, she, she died that winter after we were there. Um, but her husband was a prisoner of war uh, in Dunkirk. And so this painting was done in 1943, and my grandfather was living in a little town called Beck Hole in Yorkshire at the time. And um, they knew he was fairly well known by them, and she wanted to commission a painting of the castle and get my grandfather to communicate with her husband to keep his morale up. Mm -hmm. So they wrote back and forth, and he sent letters from Dunkirk saying where he wanted this, this painting. But this is another piece of artistic license. This is the old ruin of the castle, which doesn't exist here. It's actually on the property, but it's further down, and he just moved it in. And this is the, the ruin today. Oh, wow. So he did another painting just of that. Yes, he just did a painting of that. And it's right, is the pro does the property border the ocean? Yes. So. If you look, here's you the ocean. The this is the North Sea. Yeah. And it's, the it's, sea it's way up. It's just, it's about an hour's drive from Scotland, uh -huh. from the Scottish border. And I was just there this winter, and I'll show you some pictures. Wow. Um, so that was that. And then, so in, 19, in 1940, about, um, my grandfather had served in World War I, and um, he, he wrote a lot about pacifism. And uh, during the war and the bombings in London, he just had to get out. So he moved, he moved to uh, this little town near that castle called Beckhole, which is way, way up in, in Yorkshire. It's about a, today it's a six hour drive, seven hour drive from London. And uh, his house is over here. And this is the view out of his studio in his house. And this was the building and the tree that's still there, wow. and the building, and today there's houses that are here. But th that's the view out of his um, studio in Beck Hole. And because he loved Canaletto, he went to Italy a lot. Uh, and I took this picture last summer in Italy. It's, it took us a while to find this, because he called it the Isle of San Clemente. But it's not the Isle of St. Clement. <laughs> <laughs> so it took us, we, we found St. Clement. The island is way back here someplace. And, um, and, and we couldn't figure out the painting. But I have two versions of it, so I'm interested in your opinion as to what you prefer. This is with a modern cruise ship coming into the scene, and this is with a sailboat, like in the original painting. You know, with sailboat, it looks more similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sailboat. sailboat. You like the sailboat. Yeah, the sailboat. Okay. Yeah, the other looks like Jaws. <laughs> 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 it looks like Jaws. It looks like Jaws. It looks like Jaws. It looks like Jaws. I I see why you do like the first one because it's like ge geometrical. Like yeah. yeah. Well, and it's a, it's also this big modern ship. Yeah, right. Which, is, the which, which brings us from 1916 when this was painted, mm -hmm. or 1926 when this was painted, to. Um, yeah, but Jaws. No, I think 1916 was it? Yeah. In terms of the project, this one's more consistent with the other. With the other. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so over the winter break, because we've talked a lot about the trees that get in the way of this picture, these, these, these paintings today, um, there, there are some paintings that he did in the winter, which really plays to the project that I'm able to go back and do in the winter when all the trees are, when all the trees are off. This is, um, this is, Regent's Canal near the other paintings in the canal, and uh, this is a tunnel called Maida Vale Tunnel. So it was very easy to find, um, and this is this is the Maida Vale Tunnel today. Um, and I, these pictures, uh, I haven't done work a lot with the lab uh, attendant over in the art department, um, and we get them to a perfect. Point so we can print them because I'm printing them on a 
big pieces of paper, 24 by 30. So uh, with, with this one, for example, what would you edit in this one? What, what are the well, I'm going to work on it. It, the lighting here isn't so great, but you can see the tunnel better. Uh -huh. um, and I want to I want to bring out the tunnel. I want to bring out some of the lighting over here, mm -hmm. uh, lighten it up. Uh, that that's that's the main thing. Plus, I'm going I'm still going through these pictures. I have hundreds of pictures of each of these scenes. Okay. So you know that's an initial selection, but I may find something else uh, that I like. Um, so as we were talking about um, the smokestacks everywhere, and actually very interesting with this painting, we sent it to a guy at the London Canal Museum. He's like 90 something years old, and he knew he knew everything uh, about the canal. So we sent it to him, and it took us about six months to get an answer back from him. We kept writing him; he wouldn't respond. He wasn't digging the email. Um, but he determined that this was where that painting was taken. And this building is the pub called the Constitution Pub, which is the same building. So, so the research really goes, there's so many people in England that have such background with things that you can send a painting to somebody and they'll, they'll come up with uh, where it was. Uh, and this is, this is Algernon's home in Beck Hole in Yorkshire. So over here was that garage. And this tree is no longer there, but this is a winter scene and you can see the smoke coming out. And I had been, I was up here two years ago and we met the people in the house uh, who live in it now. And they were very kind to my brother and myself and me, but they were in a hurry and they said, Here's our contact information. If you come back, let us know. So I've been in touch with them, uh, and they invited me back. We had my wife and I had dinner with them. Uh, they they loved this project. This house was built in the 1650s, uh, and it was always a working pub until my grandfather bought it, and then it was decommissioned, and he made it into a house, and that's the house today. Oh, wow. And so. You can see the trees are different, but the wall is the same, especially in this wall here. That wall hasn't changed um, in the almost 80 years since this painting was, was made. And then there's this. The, this hill is still there, uh, but it's got a lot of bracken and stuff on it. Um, Professor Newton, before you change that one, I've got a question. I mean, we've talked a little bit about the soot and the air quality and that sort of thing. Is the difference in color of the sky, have, does that have to do with the season or the smoke or the yeah, it could be. paint? Or the paint? <laughs> yeah, it's, if you notice this sort of pastel blue, he uses it in a lot of his paintings. Okay. And if you look at his writings, he talks about mixing the colors to get this kind of color. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to, the one thing, I have other pictures. I, I'm kind of going back and forth now um, because I never got clouds like that, but I did get the light that hits. Yeah. Uh, this is a morning picture because it, it faces uh, east. Um, but it's really hard to try and, to try and match that. But um, I have pictures with clouds but then I don't have the smoke coming out of the chimney. So it's a trade-off. You just have to think about uh, which one. And then the lighting. I like the lighting, and it kind of, yeah, it's, it it's kind of matches up there. Um, so Beck Hole was this town where he went to in uh, the 1940s. And this is the pub uh, in Beck Hole. And they were really, um, it's a very small town. There's, even today, there's probably no more than 50 people who live here. Uh, and this pub is still there. Uh, and that's him. Oh. And uh, he, he, they helped him a lot while he lived in this little village during the war. And uh, so he painted a pub sign for them. And he put it up on the outside of the pub. Well, the first version of it didn't last but a year, because the weather in England is pretty horrible. And um, 
And so he, he painted another one for them, but this time he painted it on metal. And, uh, and then today, that's the cover. And that's the painting. Oh my God. And wow. it's still there. Wow. And, um, and they gave it a little roof. They gave it a little roof. <laughs> it's, behind, it's behind this horrible plexiglass. Uh -huh. It's got an alarm on it, and it's got a camera on it, because they now know that my grandfather's paintings have increased so much in value at auction that they're afraid somebody will come and steal it, but they're never going to take it off of <laughs> so that's that. So I probably need another 15 or so paintings. I've done about, I've done almost 20 now. Um, part of the problem is finding the color match. Um, my brother and my cousin are putting together a catalog resume of all of his work. Um, a lot of it is in British collections, but it's also in private collections all over the world, from New Zealand to America to, to England and Europe. Um, so I hope to get a, about another 15 or so. Uh, and then we're hoping to have a show at the Wallace Collection of my grandfather's paintings. And then these pictures will go as part of that show. Um, my cousin, my, my cousin um, uh, used to be the director of the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, his, he's now Sir Mark Jones. And, uh, he's, he's a nice, he's a pretty nice guy for being a sir. Um, he lives in Scotland now. But uh, he's been working with the Wallace Collection uh, to put on a retrospective of his work, and then we'll come by. Um, that's, that's not Algernon Newton, though. No, that's not Algernon Newton. The Wallace Collection uh, is mainly uh, French art um, and was this wealthy person's house, and it's now a museum and run by the, run by the state. But that's the location for the. Is it in London? It's in London, yeah. And then I hope a book comes out of it. That's it. Sorry about it.